Please, please kindly. To be precise about the, the title, it's like the specifics of raising children Islamically in the United States. The specifics. It's not the general, it's not the specifics. It's going to be like based on specific examples and also it will be like questions and answers. Um, so, parenting, the effective in truly Islamic environment. Parenting is effective in truly Islamic environment. And I think you can understand from that. So, everything is relative. The closer the environment is to Islam, the easier the parenting is. And you can take the proportionality. The further away from Islam the environment is, the more difficult parenting is. People can tell you, before they were Islamic schools, the situation was the children of the migrants were lost. The children of the migrants were totally lost. People who migrated before 1980, no third generation of the Muslims who migrated before 1980, no third generation remained Muslims. <coughs> That's it. The first third generation which remained Muslims according to the Islam statistics, it was in 1980-something, 85, 86. So you think about it. If you have knowledge, okay, how much of that knowledge are you going to pass to your child? It's not going to be 100 percent. Teachers never give 100 percent what they all they know to their student. So are you going to give him half, and then he will give his son half, and it won't go that way until it's totally lost. But Alhamdulillah, with establishment of Islamic centers, with establishment of Islamic schools, and and all of the Islamic all of the Islamic activities, the environment is getting closer and closer to Islam. In a way, I'm not saying 100% Islamic. I cannot claim that even in the Middle East. But anyway, everything is, in, is in using relativity. So effectively, in truly Islamic environment, children will be raised effectively. Otherwise, so the bottom line is, we have to look for and plan for Islamic environment. Okay? So, the second thing is that love for children is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled in the human being. So, not only human beings, animals love their, of course, you're not going to find an animal hates what they got. They love them. So the love is something that is instilled in the mother. Okay? So we have to take that love as something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, but we should not like assume love is for granted and never love our kids or never show our kids that we love them. We have in the tradition that someone came to the Prophet, perhaps to Umar ibn al-Khattab, and they were a talk, and then he said, when he saw the Prophet or Umar ibn Khattab, I don't recall which one, kissed him, kissed his grandson. Or, so, did you kiss your kids? She said, yes. He said, I have perhaps 12 of them, and I never kissed any, or 10 of them, I don't recall. But I don't know. Now, you can, you can imagine. How do how you think the, the response of the Prophet would have been? Oh, Prophet. Prophet. Somebody like this. this the, the Prophet. The prophet. Allah Allah. Allah. So, yeah, and mercy is an essential thing in raising kids. Okay? So, love should be a, what? You have to show your kids that you love them. Not all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you. No. At certain times, you have to, to show the love and you have to prove the love also with action. Okay? 
So love in action means what? You have to sometimes love your kid, but loving your kid is not going to go to stop you from disciplining the kid. And when you take a, a newborn and you have him get a shot, the newborn cries, right? So you're actually taking your newborn and giving him some pain. But that pain is something that you're doing because the other choice, more pain or life-threatening situation if he doesn't get the medicine. So that translates to we have to think also about punishment. Not only love, but also punishment. Because punishment is necessary. But it's not like you're just going to punish for anything, any kind of thing. Punishment should be actually examined. Okay? Is the outcome of punishment uh, more, more severe than the outcome of the, the thing the person committed? Or should I punish? Is there alternative? This lecture will be dealing with pretty much punishment and rewards. Because bringing up kids pretty much related to these two, punishment and rewards. See? Educate the child to become a good human being. And subhanAllah, the scholars said the child, even when the child in his mother's belly, could feel if Quran is recited, as opposed to, for example, if the mother listening to music all the time, listening to music, looking at serials and all of that, it has effect on the child somehow. So, first is we have to instill in the child that he has to become a good human being. <coughs> Remember, good human being. Okay? Now, obedience to parents. Obedience to parents is also absolutely necessary. We have to instill into the child that they have to be obedient to their parents. And we know if we just go through some of the chapters in Quran, Yani Isa alayhi salam, among the first things he mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him obedient to his mother. Obedient to his mother. So obedience is important. Okay. Child is a vice garret. Vice garret means what? Khalifa, right? Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels that he would what? Inni ya'ilu bil abdi khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I am to appoint a vice garret on earth. So vice garret is khalifa. What is the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Khalifa in this earth according to some scholars there are three purposes first of all the human being should actually act according to Sharia of all the prophets before and of course Sharia of the last We're starting from Adam until the last prophet Muhammad and the same human being not only commit himself to the Sharia ah of his time or Sharia ah of Muhammad these days, but also he should commit himself to making his society also compliant with what? The Sharia. Ah. Not only his society, he has to also work beyond his society for compliance with the Sharia. Ah. So the person should transform okay, human society into an Islamic one his society. The person also should transform the physical world around him into a paradise garden like. And you know what that means. Okay? Also, we have to enjoy good and forbid evil with children. <coughs> Enjoying good, of course, we have to know. If you don't know what is good, you cannot enjoy good. Right? A person should not enjoy good or forbid evil unless he knows four things. He should have the knowledge of what he enjoyed, he should have the knowledge of what he forbids. Right? He should have the knowledge of what he forbids. 
will be just in what he is forbidding, okay? and he should be just in what he is enjoying. Okay? He should be compassionate and patient with whatever he is enjoying and also whatever he is forbidding. So we have to learn, teach our kids that they have to practice enjoying good and forbidding evil, but they have to practice it gradually. They have to understand it and they have to know the etiquettes, they have to know the, the time of enjoying good, the time of forbidding evil, and they have to do it gradually. Kids, we're not talking about ourselves. Kids have to practice this. Number three, or number four, or five, I don't know, establish and live in an Islamic community. We have to keep telling our kids, we may be living in New York, we may be living in Seattle, wherever. We have to also keep telling our kids that you have to live in an Islamic society. Maybe tomorrow he will be sent to Alaska, this kid. So he has to establish, try to establish an Islamic community around him, and try to live in an Islamic community without living lonely as Shaykh Hassan, and I'm sure the Imams have talked about you know, living lonely is totally different than living among a group. Okay? One thing that we have also to instill in the kid is that okay, if there is a will, there is a way. That means if there is a goal of achieving something good, we should keep encouraging our kids that they should go for it. They can do it. You have to give the confidence to the child. This is an Islamic advice. If we don't give confidence to the child, who will give? If the parents do not give confidence to the child, who will give? Many children, actually, because they did not get this confidence from home, when they go to school, for example, sometimes, and I'm a teacher, sometimes teachers actually negatively affect kids and they actually negatively affect their, their, their esteem and the children will end up dropping out of schools. Many in our country, over here, everywhere. So we have to immune our kid from home, that they should have a will. That if other kids could go to Ivy League schools and Harvard and Dukes and all of this, they can. We have to keep telling them, our kids, this. Otherwise, it will be something foreign to them by the time they have to decide, they will be okay. Uh, I think I'm good with, for example, XYZ University, which is easy to get in and easy to get to graduate. Okay? So, if there is a will, there is a way. And if we can, like I said, satisfy the fulfillment, prof uh, self fulfillment prophecy, if we can help our kids that you can satisfy it, that's the best. Thing that we could do to our kids, among the other things also. Love should not make wrong permissible. Sometimes too much love, people see their kids and the kid would have done something, they would not actually punish the kid. They love him, so they let him do it. So the kid will ultimately think that everything I'm going to do is going to be alright. And that is actually one of the biggest mistakes most of the parents do. They just let the children do whatever they like. We have to stop them somehow. Resolve conflicts of interest in favor of Islam. If there is conflict of interest, we have to actually teach our kids to resolve it in favor of Islam. Somebody gave a good uh, question about, for example, in AIDS and all of this. We know in our, uh, when we send our kids to the schools, be it Islamic schools or um, non-Islamic schools, public schools or private schools, there are a lot of things that are contrary to what we teach them. So sometimes what we give them at home may be contrary to what we tell them outside somewhere. So there will be different elements in their brains working against each other. The kid has to decide which one to adopt. So if, if there is one of them weaker than the other one, the kids will, be, will adopt what the stronger. So the home should always try to, to provide the educational and the prevention mechanisms that are that be, uh, that stronger enough to give the kids this kind of resistance to uh, 
uh, the pressure, peer pressure, peer pressure, and so on and so forth. So resolving the interest, uh, resolving any conflict should be in favor of Islam. For example, uh, uh, protocols, Eids, that should not be Eids, I'm sorry, I didn't mean Eid, I meant Eid. So Eid, for example, a uh, lot of Eids people celebrate. If, if there is conflict, resolve it Islamically. Okay? Uh, protocols, there are some protocols that are actually not Islamic. Okay? So you have to figure out how you can somehow instill in the kid how to analyze and how to resolve it based on or for Islam. And that's not going to come without love to Allah, love to Islam, love to the kid, to the parents, and also seeing the parents as a model. And the parents should give the best model because if the parent is not the best model, the kid is not going to follow the parent. Okay? Love of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ, and Islam are required if the person is to have the kid resolve everything in, in, the, in the interest of Islam. If he wants the kid to be a good human, if he wants the kid to perform righteously, if he wants the kid to have self-esteem, if he wants empathy and efficacy and all the traits of good learners, good people, helpful people, first they have to teach them to love Allah and His Prophet more than anything else. And we have to keep instilling this in their brains. And of course, they have to love the Islamic values. Okay? Also, they have to see and understand things in the context of Islam. Everything that comes across them, they should always put it in the frame of reference of Islam. So everything has to be within the context of Islam. Also, we have to educate and prepare our kids. If you don't educate and prepare your kid, it's like you're throwing a soldier in the middle of the battlefield and you did not train the soldier. How would that soldier actually react? That soldier will be what? Totally loser. Will not be able to defend himself and he may end up captured and he may end up in a slave and he may end up totally lost. So we have to educate and prepare the kid we have to warn the kid and threaten the kid. Okay? Now, why educate the kid? Not only to prepare him outside, but also to shape him up. If I want to shape up a kid, I have to educate him, I have to prepare them, I have to <coughs> warn them, but then I have to threaten them, and then after threatening them, I have to punish them. Not punish them physically to the extent that they hurt them, but punish them. Now, if a kid did something wrong, sometimes, look at this, one scenario, kid did something wrong, he will be punished. Sometimes the kid would not even know why he or she was punished. Okay? Some people, they will come, okay, you did this. This is wrong, they punish them. When the kid received the word, this is wrong, that was the time the kid knew that what he did was wrong. And then, he got the punishment, which is also wrong. The first two cases are also wrong. Okay? The wiser thing is not to tell the kid, actually, okay, you did this, it's wrong, okay? Don't do it again. No. Better than this, we have to educate the kid about what is wrong and what's right. So when the kid commits something that is wrong, we have to tell him, look, we reminded you it's wrong, you did it now, this is a warning. Like in, in, in Arabic they say, That means we give you a warning, next time you will be punished. So the kid will remember this more than if he is punished or she is punished. If he is punished, or she is punished, it's likely that he will commit the same mistake. But if he was told, and then he was forgiven when he committed the mistake, he will think 
twice, and it's not likely, according to psychologists, it's not likely that this kid will commit the same mistake. But the kid who committed the mistake and punished without excuse, without giving him, okay, this is the first time, don't do it again, he's very likely to do it again, the kid who's punished right away. So we have to educate, prepare, warn, threaten, and then when it comes to punishment, punishment should not be always physical. Punishment could be deprive him from some rights that he has or some privileges that you give him. Okay? Something that he likes or say she likes. Absolutely. Yes. So it should be it should be punishment should not be physical. Physical should be the last, the very last result okay, for a person to discipline the kid. Okay? And when you punish, punish wisely. And I want to hear from any of you what what does it mean to say punish wisely? What does it mean to say punish wisely? Punishment could be what? Physical, like I said. But punish wisely. Let's go to Quran. What does Quran say about dealing with the wife when the wife does not listen to her husband, for example? The first thing is what? Advice. Huh? Yes. Okay, the second. <coughs> okay, so the equivalent of advice for kids is equivalent of advice, right? What is the equivalent of the second one for the for the for the wife, for the kid? The analogy of you know the resolution for the wife, the second, right? Right. Hmm? Okay, those who are married, tell me <laughs> what is the equivalent of that for the kid? We in America, we America is it, day and night. Americans do it every day. Yeah. Pretty what, much. What is it? We must take, take take TV away from electronics. Uh, no, no, it's talking about what's the verse saying. Fa'a dhu hunna wa juru hunna fil madajir hajr hajr. To not show them the affection that you normally. Let me ask you, general general households in America, when a kid does something wrong, what is it? Go to the room. Time out. Yes. Time out, right? So, go to your room, close your room. Okay? That's it. Punish. The last result is what? A physical punishment. To the extent that it will not leave traces and it will not what? Break home. Break home. Now. Likewise, for the children. And the most important thing is that when the kid does something wrong, the very first thing that we should ask ourselves as parents is that who is the failure? Me or the kid? I am the failure. I did not really educate my kid enough. I did not prevent or, or use preventative measure for my kid to commit the sin. So if I got angry and I punished the kid while I am angry, what is the effect of that on the kid himself or herself? Yes, when that kid gets angry, he will punish right away. If the kid sees the dad or the mom any time they get angry, ooh, psh, ooh, psh. the kid among his peers, if he gets angry, he will behave that way. So never discipline a child when you are angry. When you're angry, stay away. Because sometimes some people, they discipline the kids, and then they regret. I'll tell you about something happened in, 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 in Lebanon. I think one kid did, did something wrong. And the father, he took a ruler. And rulers are from wood. Rulers, and he just punished the kid with, with angry. And the kid went to his room and he was crying. He was only three years or four years old. He went to his room and he was crying. The next morning, they went, he had fever, and his hand was all bruised and black and swollen. They took him to the hospital. In the hospital, they told the dad what? We have to amputate this hand. That's it. Because if we don't amputate it, Later on, we have to amputate the arm. Okay. So they amputated the hand of the kid. Still, the kid doesn't, didn't know why. 
for why he was punished. Didn't know that his hand is gone. He was brought home. He said, Daddy, I'm not going to do it again. Please take me. Let them put back my hand. How can he get that, back, that hand put back? There's no way. Many people punish, and then after they punish, they realize that they actually destroy the moral of their kids, and they hurt them. Sometimes it doesn't have to be physical. It could be mental way of hurting the kid. That's going to destroy the kid forever. So never punish when you are angry. Okay? If you have to punish the kid, think about, okay, which one is worse? To punish the kid or to deprive him from something he loves? Deprive him. Okay? So maybe in some situations, depriving him from something he loves is more, okay, destroying for the kids. So punish him. But if the punishment is more, then don't punish. So pick the least of the two harms. There should always be alternative for punishment, like depriving the kid from, from something they get, for example. So <coughs> use the least of the two. Resolve to punishment only when it is the best thing that is left. Okay? So do not punish when you are angry. Okay? If you do so, then when the child angry, get angry, the child will punish. Okay? When will it becomes or when will it becomes necessary to punish the child? We just talked about it. When will it become necessary to punish the child? When you use the the other parents category. did not adequately enforce preventative measures. <laughs> right? So before I punish the child, I have to remember this. Because it becomes necessary to punish the child when the parents did not actually do all the preventative measures and enforce them at home to make sure that they immune the child from committing that mistake. We're human beings who make mistakes, but some mistakes are avoidable. So that is the one that I'm talking about here. Okay? Punish when its outcome overweighs its alternative. Like I said, if the alternative okay, is less destroying to the kid, do the alternative. But if the alternative is severe, then punish. Okay? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa listen to this. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never punished a child, never punished a wife, never punished a servant. How many of us can make this statement? How many of us? And, and, and not only that, and the Prophet ﷺ made a statement, subhanAllah. And he said what? Related to the wives. He said, Khayrukum. Khayrukum li ahli. Khayrukum. Khayrukum li ahli. The best among you <coughs> are the best to their wives. To their wives. And he said, I'm the best to my wife. Let me ask you this question. If all of us were married, our wives are inside, and they ask them, is he the best? What would they say? My wives will say, uh, my wife would say, my wives would say, I. Uh -huh. They would say, me. No, no, no. I'm saying, if they went to our wives, all of us, our wives are in the other room. Mm -hmm. And they told them, one after the other one, they asked them, is your husband the best? What would their response would be? No. Absolutely. <laughs> Wives see their husband as the worst, right? <laughs> Not the best. Not my wives, yeah. Huh? Not my wives. Trust me, even if they didn't say, yeah, subhanAllah. Wallahi, those who, those, who, those who disagree, mashallah, Allah bless them with, mashallah, very obedient wives. Okay, here, call my wife and ask. Here, call her, I, I, I challenge. 
and make a contribution to the union right away, hundred dollars. I was one time giving a lecture somewhere, I don't know in Chicago somewhere, I don't remember. But they were like, it was a lecture for, for women, and I asked them, who among you will tell me that her husband is the best? None raised their hand. La hawla wa la quwa. None raised their hand. La hawla wa la quwa. I don't know what my wife would say, but <laughs> sure, she's not going to say he's the best. <laughs> okay. So, never argue with a child. This is a bad thing. Huh? <laughs> men, normally, men normally talk about, especially in front of women, they talk about that Allah, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, if I have to order someone to prostrate, I would have ordered the, man, the woman to prostrate to her. And they talk about all women, women, women. But what we also forget is that the Prophet said, خيركم, خيركم So there is pressure on men too. <laughs> you want to be the best among your peers? Be the best to your wife. That's a criteria. Very simple. Be the best to your wife. If you want to be the best among your peers, be the best to your wife and Allah will make you the best among your peers. Subhanallah. So never argue with children because argument is going to leave a bad impression and it's going to actually the impression is permanent in their hearts, it will be reflected in their behavior in the future. And they will become people who argue. If the, par the parents are argument argumentally that, that a good word, then the children will follow. They will become, unless there are exceptions. Okay? Shape children to pray through gentle encouragement. Shape children to pray through gentle encouragement. What does it mean? That means I will have to encourage a child when he was or when he is below seven years old. Encourage him. Take him to the monastery. Let him pray with you at home. And then Thank you for your help. at seven I have to do what? Order the child to pray. Order the child to pray. Okay? But then when the child prays and listens to the order, I should not take it for granted and leave it. No. I have to commend the child. I have to reward the child. And I have to keep commending and rewarding the child for praying. If the child did not pray until 10 years old, I have to do what? Punishment. But punishment should be gentle punishment. Okay? Punish at 10 for not praying. Memorization of Quran improves their LLL traits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This thing, there is a good research that supports this. LLL mm -hmm. stands for lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. SubhanAllah. It's true. Lifelong learning is in, is in Quran. 1400 years ago, the Sahaba knew about lifelong learning. Now, we know that lifelong learning is the ideal way of educating kids. And there are like 25 schools around the nation. There are projects for lifelong learning. Lifelong learning reduces the violence among children. Lifelong learning traits make the children more obedient. Lifelong learning make the children resist the pressure, peer pressure. Lifelong learning made the children team workers. There is research here in the United States. Different ethnicities, different areas. They did lifelong learning. So maybe at different centers we have to think about lifelong learning. Now my question is as follows. I made a statement that memorization